Hey everybody, QuestWise here, and today we're going to conclude our two-part series on investigating or looking at superhero RPGs. Uh, if, you, if you watched the last video, part one, we talked about things like Vigilante City, and we talked about Heroes Unlimited and a number of other games. Today I have three more games I want to talk about, and at the end I'll kind of wrap it up and tell you what my favorite ones were. Again, this list, this, this two-part series is all about my personal opinion on superhero role-playing games and which ones I think are the best and the reasons why I think that I enjoy them the most. Uh, but anyway, let's just get started. We got three to talk about today. The first one is the classic Marvel superheroes role-playing game. This is from TSR back in 1984. This is an out-of-print product. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, you can find them online probably at Wayne's books or or some other you know vintage role playing supplier uh, but this one is out of print unfortunately it was written by Jeff Grubb and Steve Winter both names that went on uh, if you're familiar with classic D&D &D titles you'll know these names very very well came as a box set that was a big thing back in the 80s with role playing games from TSR especially uh you know Dungeons and Dragons and all of their supplements um came as a box set with uh, a bunch of great stuff. Uh, all the box sets were really amazing. I'm really nostalgic for that box set idea from the 80s. Um, it used a system, uh, the, the, the core mechanic was, it was uh, affectionately known nowadays as the phase rip system. And then what it was is that in cap, those were the, the stats, your attributes that your characters had that was Fighting, agility, strength, endurance, reason, intuition, and psyche. And, you know, together they were called the phase rip system. Um, it was a system in which your uh, your character had uh, these abilities that were um, both a number and a, a nomen it had a nomenclature to it. So it might be extraordinary or amazing. It made it feel, feel very epic, very um, comic book style kind of thing. And you would roll your dice whenever you were attempting to do some sort of thing and, and compare it to this chart. And it would, cross-referencing the chart would tell you whether you were successful, you failed, or if you had some kind of extraordinary success and that kind of thing. It was a very great system. It works very, very well. The great thing was is that everything you needed was on this one chart and you could take the chart and you know, lay it in the middle of the table, or or make it's a little harder in the, in the back in the day, but currently you can make color photocopies and hand them to the different players, and you had everything you needed right there, sort of in front of you. Now, while the game was intended that you would play existing heroes, people like Cyclops and Wolverine and you know, Doctor Strange, they all had stats for those things in there. It did have some rules for making your own characters. And I think most of the fun for me uh, at the time was playing characters because that was the thing that really got me interested in. Uh, I, was, I was a big fan of comic books when I was introduced to role-playing games. And so the, the idea of taking my favorite characters and playing out these adventures on a tabletop with my friends was very, very appealing to me. So while it was fun to, um, you know, to create my own characters, I really enjoyed being able to play these classic or these, you know, my favorite Marvel characters uh, at a tabletop, taking on those personas and playing those characters. It, in its day, was sort of the height of superhero RPGs and was amazing. Now, there was a DC version out there. I never played it. I was not a DC fan until much later in my life. Um, but the Marvel superheroes uh, role-playing game from TSR still stands up as one of the biggest classics I can think of and one of my favorites. The only, I would say, downfall, and we avoided this a lot too, is that if you were, whenever you did movement on a, it was sort of a, it was sort of broken down by sort of sections of areas on a map, uh, which was cool. Uh, it was a little bit ab abstract. Um, and sometimes we didn't use that when we played, but it does work really, really well. I have played it in the past several years, and it does work very well, especially if you're using miniatures. It's very nice to be able to just be like, oh, I can move three areas on this map kind of thing, as opposed to being like sort of 60 feet or some kind of thing. 
Uh, it was a little bit abstract, and then back in the day it made it seem kind of weird. But when I played it just five or six years back or so, uh, it works really, really well. And it was one of those things I'm kind of kicking myself for not having done more of when, originally when it came out. The next one I want to talk about is the Marvel Heroic role-playing game. This was from Margaret Weiss Productions. It came out in 2012. This game was beautiful. It was created by um, Cam Banks and Rob Donahue. And it meant to emulate a very cinematic comic book kind of style. It used the Cortex Plus system, which if you guys aren't familiar, was used for, I believe, Firefly role-playing game, Leverage role-playing game, and there was also sort of a generic sort of Cortex Plus that you could buy to build your own games. And this was a, a game in which it was meant to emulate. It was actually called in certain things, uh, certain articles, a comic book style game as opposed to a role-playing game. And that was because every character... So stats were, were uh, um, they were uh, denoted by a D, like a, by a die code. So a D4 was the lowest, a D12 was your, you know, a higher level. Um, but every, every character had very unique abilities. They were, they were, um, how would I say it? They're very much denoted by a, um, a nomenclature there was like an actual phrase like um you know captain america i could do this all day that, that kind of thing wolverine would be like hey bub um something like that where in that it was very every character was very unique and it had very a lot of dynamism to their characters the problem was it was kind of hard for newer players to grasp like uh, well what does he do again why doesn't my other character do this kind of same thing too there was no sort of um uh, um fixed sort of you know system to that kind of thing and it was meant to be very narrative and it works very well because it makes the characters feel very unique very individualistic and again this game was meant to be played with existing characters i found the rules for making your own characters a little clunky because of this idea that you know rather than saying i have a d10 in my strength it was more like um you know the fastball special kind of thing right it's it was very fluid and very different, so it was a little bit more difficult to come up with a character of your own, but it was it was a lot easier to play an existing character that was already sort of tooled up for you. And I really enjoyed this game. Um, uh, the, it was also so cinematic, so narratively driven, that uh, your abilities had these, you had different sort of ranks to your abilities. You had the solo mode, you had a buddy mode, and you had team mode, and so this built those things like, you know, I work better as a team with the X-Men. I work better alone, sort of like Wolverine or, you know, a, a Punisher, those kinds of things. Uh, and then there was team, so there was like the dynamic duo kind of idea of characters, and that was really, really, really nice. The best thing I found about this game, and something I still use in a lot of the other role-playing games I use, it's had one of the best initiative systems I have ever seen in a role-playing game. And to briefly kind of touch on what it was and what it is, is that the game master who was running the game would set up the scene of what was happening, the combat scenario, and they would choose who would go first. What character best fit the actual narrative of the story to go first in this certain situation? That character would take their action, then they would choose who would go next on down the line. It would just kind of keep bouncing around. Now, you would think that everybody would choose the game master to go last, right? That, that, that the enemy would go last. The problem is, is that once it comes back around, that everybody's gotten a turn, that last player gets to choose who gets to go first again. Thus, if the players all decided that the game master got to go last, the villains could actually activate twice in a row and really ruin your day. So it was a very dynamic, a very, very cool initiative system. It allowed the players to set up cool combos, cool ideas. The idea of the fastball special where the thing would grab Wolverine and chuck him, right? That couldn't happen in a traditional uh, initiative system where everybody rolled and went down a rank. Because if, you know, Wolverine had gone first in the initiative rank, he couldn't do his special attack after the thing had thrown him. 
So it was very nice. It was a very cool system. I tried to use it in any game that's not tied specifically to its initiative systems, and it works really, really well. It makes the players think a little bit about more teamwork. It makes them think a little bit more about the dynamic of the combat situation and stuff as well, too. One of my all-time favorites. Last game on the list today is Tiny Super's role-playing game. This is from Gallant Knight Games and Alan Barr. I believe this was published in 2018, 2019. I can't remember exactly. It was a Kickstarter project that was successful. It is now available as a PDF and print on demand over at Drive-Thru RPG. I don't know if you can get it anywhere. I don't know if you can get it through Lulu or not, but it is on Drive-Thru RPG with a variety of different printing options and stuff as well, too. This game uses a tiny D6 system, which has been used in a lot of other things, like Tiny Dungeon and Tiny Wastelands and Tiny Pirates and all those kind of things. Now, this has nothing to do with the size of your character. Uh, what this has to do with is a minimalistic approach to role-playing, uh, and not role-playing itself, but to the dice mechanic itself. It is super simple. It is so out of the way of the narrative of the game. This is a really cool system. So tiny d6, generally you're going to roll 2d6. Anytime you roll a 5 or a 6, it's a success. If you have advantage, you roll 3d6. If you have disadvantage, you roll 1d6. You can see where I'm going with this. It is super, super simple. And that is basically all you need to teach people. So the game is meant to be very narrative. It's meant to be very fast. And it incorporates these cool traits and abilities that you build uh, when you're creating a character to make a superhero. The game is also very well illustrated. It's beautiful. It's very dynamic. It feels very comic booky. And yeah, I don't know what else to say much about Tiny uh, Supers. It's very, very cool. The entire Tiny line is very, very well done. And we'll talk more about those in the future as well, too. Um, I'd like to go through and try to maybe do a review on each one of the Tiny games tiny d6 games that are out there on the market so my favorites out of the whole list of last uh part one and part two of this whole thing i'm going to break it down by first second and third place and simply because of how i prefer to play and what i find as being a very good uh superhero role playing game number one would be heroes unlimited uh, we talked about this in the last video. Heroes Unlimited was one of the very first games I played, so it's very nostalgic to me in my heart. I really like the way it's built. I really like the way um, that it creates, allows you to create any kind of character, and it's very dynamic in that sense as well, too. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly because it's nostalgic to me, and I love to run it, and I love um, I love the, the packaging behind it and everything as well. So Heroes Unlimited. Number two, Tiny Supers. I like my superhero games to be more cinematic and less complicated. So Tiny Supers does that for me uh, in a great, great way. Very minimalistic rules. I can teach it to anybody in just a few minutes, and we are on our way. Um, Tiny Supers. Number three would be Marvel Superheroes. Because of its classicness and because of the way that its rule system, its chart that it uses for the phase rip system, really revolutionized the way that superhero role-playing games can be cinematic while at the same time sort of fitting into an old school kind of package. So that's my top three. This is my, my review of superhero role-playing games. Um, there are many, many more out there. There really, really are. And there's some really great ones out there. These are the ones that I know the best, the ones that I've played the most. Uh, if you have a favorite, drop it in the link or, you know, on the notes down below. Let me know what your favorite is and why. Um, and if you can convince me, maybe I'll go pick it up and do a review on this channel for you as well, too. So until next time, I'm QuestWise, and I am out. Hey there, fellow Questing Knights. If you're looking to collect vintage RPGs or would like to start and you don't know where to go, or if you're looking for a supplement to fill in that hole in your collection, I highly recommend Wayne's Books. Yeah, that's right. Wayne's Books, since 2002, have sold thousands of vintage RPGs. I highly recommend them. I've used them in the past, and I have nothing but 100% satisfaction with their service. So if you get a chance, swing on over to Wayne's Books and pick up everything you'll need vintage RPG-wise. I'm QuestWise, and until next time, I am out.